But first, let me introduce uh, Professor Mary Berman. And let me start in a slightly different place. You know, even though some hospital patients think otherwise, Wyoming's nurses do not come down from heaven. <laughs> they must go through a long period of training, education, and learning experiences. Such education is somewhat easy to obtain in the big city, but in rural Wyoming, not so much. Since Mary Berman became UW's Dean of Nursing in 2008, it has become easier, however. Today, the nursing major is one of Wyoming's most popular degrees with nearly 700 students. And I say Wyoming rather than UW because people throughout the state earn the degree without leaving home and heading to Laramie. Dr. Berman has worked tirelessly to create a curriculum that provides nursing education across the state Nursing students train not only at the university, but via distance education and in cooperation with the state's uh, community college, including Western Wyoming College right here. And of course, they work with the hospitals and the clinics uh, and the offices around the state as well. The graduates go straight into local nursing jobs where they make up the backbone of Wyoming's healthcare network. Professor Berman has the academic uh, credentials that one usually expects of a dean. She earned her PhD from the University of Wisconsin in 1990. Oh my goodness, Michigan. Sorry. Oh, oh. All right. At least he didn't uh, say Ohio. I know. Right. At least he didn't say Ohio State. All right. Uh, so, for the University of Michigan in 1990. All right. And then came to Wyoming in 1992 as an assistant professor. What has followed was a continual string of research grants, projects, publications, and community involvement until she reached the rank of full professor, and then just kept going. Last year, her achievements were recognized by the American Academy of Nursing, wow. which made her a fellow in nursing's highest honor. But despite all this academic work and achievement, she still volunteers at Laramie's Downtown Clinic, which she founded in the early 1990s to serve the medical needs of the state's poor uh, citizens. So today, um, she's going to talk about a somewhat controversial topic called Repeal and Replace, a delegate game of Jenga, in which she's going to look at health care and how political decisions uh, might affect it. Uh, but she looks at from the perspective of the dean and for, from the perspective of the nursing in trenches. I give you Professor Mary Brown. Thank you. After uh, Dr. Roberts' talk, I was thinking now for something, as Monty Python said, now for something completely different. <laughs> We're going to talk about health care. Let me see if I can. What I want to go over for you is a little bit of historical context following up on Dr. Roberts' uh, talk for you. How did we get to where we're at today with this kind of patchwork hodgepodge system of payment and providers? It's complicated. We'll frame that a little bit. I'm going to, though, spend my time on sort of a primer on health insurance and particularly health care reform to understand how, how all these pieces fit together. Why is this? If we remove one piece of Obamacare, we've just created a game of Jenga and the whole tower falls over. We'll talk a little bit about ACA Obamacare. I'll give you some of the major components that relate to what mostly we're talking. I mean, Obamacare is huge. We'll talk about some of the main provisions of it. Then we're going to talk about these challenges to repeal and replace and what those might mean for us. Um, and then I'll say a little bit about what's next, but that's a big mystery. That's a huge question mark. Uh, Trump has come out again, President Trump, this week talking about another new plan. Um, after a couple weeks ago saying that health care was completely off the table for a while. So we'll see what happens. My what next, I'll be kind of curious a year to now to go back and listen to what I might have said now and we'll see if I was in any way accurate at all. So what I want to set the context, like I said, historically. Health care reform has been around for a long, long time and I think we forget about that. Um, the Republicans were famous for saying when the ACA was being heard that how could they spring this on us so quickly. Well, it turns out we've been talking about health care reform for a long, long time. This picture over here is uh, from one of the labor movements in the early 1900s. Um, they were really pushing compulsory health insurance at that time. So this goes way, way back. I 
put this in because it's just delightful. This is from 1939, this um, physician talking about, is people's health a government responsibility? So we have actually been debating that particular topic for a long, long time. What should the federal government's role be? What should be the state's role? So none of this is really new. We have been talking about this for a long, long time. So how did we get to this particular point that we're at? Let me kind of walk you through that. When you think back to the early 1900s, this is when those, the notion of sickness funds began to be established. So often employer groups would get together and everybody would put some money into a pot and that money would then go back out to those who were in that group, often to do much more coverage of wages than actual health coverage. It was wages that were more, if you lost your wages, that was a bigger impact than needing to cover the costs of health care because it didn't particularly cost much that time. As an aside, we can have, uh, at some point, you can ask Dr. Roberts about one of the very early sickness funds in the state of Wyoming, for example. But out of that then later came the Blue Cross and Blue Shield, the real building up of the insurance industry itself. Part of this was to cover hospital care and then part of Blue Cross and Blue Shield was to cover physician care. But that really began the whole health insurance movement followed by the commercial insurers, the for-profit ones. Blue Cross and Blue Shield were non-profit. Most of them are, a lot of them are to this day, although not all of Blue Cross. There's a, there are for-profit um, arms of Blue Cross and Blue Shield at this particular point. But initially they were all non-profit, but then the big for-profit commercial insurers started to get into the market. Um, and then came World War II, and I think this is a, a small but important piece to remember. We really based our coverage of health care on employers. And why did that come about? Well, we can trace that back to World War II. During World War II, there were wage controls in place, so you couldn't increase people's wages. But it turns out you could, within a certain amount, up people's benefits. So health insurance became really a nice thing for employers during World War II when they couldn't negotiate or change wages, they could actually provide health insurance for people. So that was sort of the first step down the pike, but then in the early 1950s, the IRS after World War II ruled that those contributions were tax deductible then. I mean, we're not taxed. Well, this is an incredible thing. They're tax exempt now. So employer, this is how the big employer market really came about, which is why most of us today are covered by an employer in terms of our health insurance. It became a big collective bargaining unit thing as well. It was a nice way for collective bargaining units to come in and negotiate around health coverage for the, for the beneficiaries as well. <laughs> So that's the 1940s and the 1950s. What happens in 1960s? Um, LBJ comes into office and uh, passes amazing legislation around Medicare and Medicaid. As you, know, as you may or may not know, I don't know why we named them so close, Medicaid and Medicare. It would have been better to have two very different names because it gets confusing about what is what. Medicaid is for older adults and disabled persons. Um, it's more of a health insurance. Then you have Medicaid, which is really, and initially uh, came out of sort of the welfare movement, so it had much more of a welfare piece to it. Um, it's for low income. You have to meet, initially you had to meet certain asset limitations and be in a category. So while you may have been somebody who was very low income, if you didn't fall in a, in a category, you, wouldn't get, you would not get coverage by Medicaid. Uh, the Obamacare um, ACA actually for the first time changed that part of Medicaid. Um, then came S-CHIP during the Clinton administration. This was the children's health insurance program. So this covered children. It did not cover their parents. So again, it's sort of categorical in nature. Your children could be eligible for, for S-CHIP, but you as their parent would not be eligible for S-CHIP. And then finally, the most recent large scale um, change in healthcare was the ACA or Obamacare. Now I put this picture up because it's one of my favorites. This, of course you probably all know who this is. LBJ, LBJ. who's sitting next to him here? Like Barry, <laughs> Barry Gold, it's not Barry Goldwater. It's actually Truman. When, when the ACA, or, or when the um, Medicare and Medicaid were passed, um, LBJ, against, I guess, the advice of his advisors, said they were going to go to Missouri to sign the legislation because Harry Truman had really been an early uh, promoter of um, universal health care. And so they flew, he was at this time in very poor health, but they flew, all got in a plane and flew to Missouri and he signed the legislation in Missouri with Harry Truman sitting right beside him. And reportedly, Harry Truman was extremely touched to have had this happen.
So because of this historical context, we end up with this really interesting hodgepodge of payment systems in our country. So for those of you who are without insurance, you're in this particular part of it. So these are individuals who pay directly out of pocket to a provider for their health care. So these are folks who are uninsured. Um, now what's challenging about that group is that they get charged, if you're in a hospital, they get charged list price or charge master price which are, tend to be significantly higher. When you look at things like Medicaid and Medicare, they've negotiated, these big payers have negotiated with health systems. Well, if I'm an individual, it's sort of hard for me to say, well, I need my gallbladder out next week. Can I come in and negotiate my price for my gallbladder? So if you're in this particular part of the healthcare system, you are paying top dollar, um, and you don't have that really, nothing in there buffers that relationship. It's a direct relationship. Then we have the individual market here. This is different than the employer market. This is the part that the marketplace exchange came in and beefed up. But this is very different. So this is an individual who pays, him or herself pays that premium to a health plan. The health plan turns around and makes the payment to the provider. Um, this market is the one that's been most challenging because you don't have the big groups in it. That's the advantage of employer-based insurance. The employer has whatever, 500 in em employees, and comes into the market with all those employees together. In this particular market, the individual is the one uh, by themselves, which makes it much more complicated. So then we have the employer-based market here. The employer, by and large, pays the premium, although, as you know, for many of you who have employment insurance, you may, as an individual, be paying part of that premium as well. And the amount that employers are paying, employees are paying is growing over time. That's one of the places where employers have offset some of the increasing costs of insurance. They've put that on the backs of their employees, which makes some sense at some level. But the employer generally is paying the premium to the health plan. The health plan then is making the payment to the provider as well. So that's the employment part of this whole picture. And then we have the federal programs here. In those, and those are completely different because it's typically the taxpayer who's paying taxes, which then are converted and paid over to a health plan, which then pays the payment, which then pays the provider. The individuals mostly enroll. Um, so they're not necessarily paying for that. That's really true in Medicaid. It's not quite true in Medicare. In Medicare, there are premiums that have to be paid Part B, for example, which is the physician coverage, um, the individuals actually pay a premium into that part of it. So that's how this, we've got this weird, wacky patchwork of stuff. And how people get covered and how much is covered all varies depending on which of these you happen to end up in. So out of that came the question of why healthcare reform, and this is a recent article, and I thought it summed it up probably the best of anything I've read recently. The United States is unique internationally in that it is a very wealthy nation with a lavishly funded healthcare sector, but it lacks an effective structure to direct spending and system reconstructuring. So while the U.S. system can produce some of the best high-tech healthcare in the world and leads in research and development spending, it wastes, and I've highlighted that in red, it wastes money on an epic scale and suffers from glaring disparities in health insurance coverage and access to care. And I'll walk through a couple of those so you can set the context of where we're at in terms <coughs> of health care. Um, so I like this cartoon. This little guy says, well, I can't, it's, he says, I can't afford that diagnosis. Do you have a cheaper one? <laughs> and I think probably all of us have been feeling that lately. Even just the common cold gets to be more and more expensive these days. But I think this really puts the whole thing in context at the individual level. If you think about it, in the United States, we spend on average close to $10,000 per person in the country per year. This is incredible. I'll show you a slide in a minute that puts this into a broader context. But if you take that and think about that the average family has about 2.5 people in it, that means on average we spend about $24,000 for a family on health care. Now, to even make that go a little bit further, think about it that the average um, income in the United States, median income, is about $54,000 a year. Um, that would mean if you actually had to pay for all of this yourself out of pocket, it would mean almost 50% of your salary would need to go simply to cover health care costs. Now, that's assuming this 24000 um, up here is assuming that there's no subsidies or an employer paying anything into that. This is if you had to pay all of it. 
So think about if you're in the individual insurance market, why that market is so challenging. This really, really highlights that piece of it. It also highlights it in the sense if you're the employer or somebody else paying for that coverage, why it's complicated. Because think of how much that, per that employer or who's ever subsidizing that has to pay in order for this to be something that can actually be attainable by an individual family. So this really hits how healthcare costs hit at the individual level. Let's take that a little bit further. Think about how these rising costs impact um, how we spend our money at the federal level. This is fed historical and projected federal spending on health care and other programs. And if you look at this tan part, it really gets at what's happening here. This is actual through here and then projected from here on out. But look at what's happening to health care, particularly off into the future. And look what's happening to all other spending and what falls into all other spending. Um, lots and lots of stuff. You've got Social Security down here, so this is everything else the federal government spends money on. And because of this increasing, if these would stay true, um, this increasing spending in health care, this pushes out spending. The pie gets smaller and smaller for the other parts of the health of the federal government. I didn't put this up, but you can look at the same thing at the state level as well. The same sort of slide labeled slightly differently shows the same kind of thing. And it's because of that huge growth of Medicaid at the state level um, as well. So that gets at this sort of what's happening at the at government level. But let's look at it even in another way. Um, and this really gives you per capita spending in the United States relative to a number of other developed countries. United States is this gigantic blue bar. This is a slightly different year. This is 2012, which is why it's lower than the other slide, but nine, roughly 9,000. The next country is Switzerland, which if you follow that down is probably spending about $6,000 per capita for healthcare in that country. Something is wrong when we're spending this much per capita relative to others. And again, these are developed countries. These are not undeveloped countries. Um, so something is wrong. Now, when you put it together with slides like this that really show that not only do we spend lavishly, as that quote was said, we also have huge disparities as well. This is a slide that just came out and was published last week in JAMA. What this is over here is the expected age of death and then household income across here. So look, if you're up here, if you're making a decent income, life looks pretty good to you. You're going to live probably into the 80s or 90s. But look at down here if you are in the lower incomes. Look at the profound disparities in death rates based on income alone. This is stunning. I see your face is just grimacing. It, yes, this is, we should be terribly disturbed by this slide. We spend lavishly in our country, and yet this is the disparity we see in terms of health care um, in our society. This is another one that sort of drives home that same point, but shows it in a different way. So here's the United States. Here's the median for these countries here. And again, these are all developed countries. Our um, average lifespan is significantly lower than any of the others that are up there. Look at this. This is infant mortality. Um, infant mortality is a measure in general used to really look at, a, at the health of a population overall. It's targeted at infants, but the idea is that a country that is healthy will have low infant mortality rates, and that, that's indicated by that rate. Now, this is a low mortality rate in a lot of ways. If you look at a, you know, a much less developed country, their, their infant mortality rates are going to be significantly higher than this. But how is it that in the United States we have an infant mortality rate of 6.1? Look at here at Australia, 3.6, Denmark, 3.5, Japan, 2.1. Um, something is not right in our country. Healthcare reform is something that we really need to do. I will stand up here and tell you that I think where we're at right now is still not where we need to be at all. But turning, back and, and turning around and going back is probably not what we need either. This will only worsen the statistics that I'm showing you here as well. So that's a bit about where we are, sort of the context of how we got there, the historical context, and where we are in the United States in terms of health care and our outcomes. So let's step back and talk a little bit about health insurance, how this all fits together. This is an interesting quote because it really drives home about health insurance. We call it health insurance, but in fact it isn't. We can't insure you against poor health. Um, insurance is a guarantee, usually a financial guarantee, against an unforeseen event. But of course, no one, much less an insurer, can guarantee against getting sick or recovering from illness. So instead, we insurers 
write policies that provide financial protection um, from medical expenses. And we're not doing particularly well about that in our country right now. We do not protect people. Medical bankruptcy rates are extremely high in the United States, even for people who are insured. So I want to talk about two important concepts that underlie insurance itself, but really help understand what's, what's going on in terms of the Obamacare and the ideas of repeal and replacement. So one of the very first notions of health insurance is something called adverse selection. And I put this description of it up here. Adverse selection in healthcare exists when you know more about your likely healthcare um, your service use than does your insurer. Insurers deal with that problem by trying to design risk classes that they group together because they've got similar risks and then they charge premiums that reflect that differential risk. So you've got the younger healthy people over here and if you group them together as an insurer, their premium can be quite a bit lower. Then over here you've got the people that got all kinds of illnesses and are gonna be more expensive and you charge them a higher uh, premium. And that makes some sense at some level. Um, you want, again, to be ideal in a healthcare, you'd really want this blending in which you've got a lot of healthy people combined with sick people. But what we've done over time is this idea of experience rating where we did really truly pull them apart. In part because if you pull them apart, you get younger people to sign up for a health insurance. If you keep premiums high, somebody who's healthy is gonna say, I'm not gonna sign up for insurance. It's too expensive and I don't need it and I'll just wait and see what happens. So this notion of adverse selection is really critical when we talk about Obamacare because it underlies decisions that have been made about what coverage should look like. And again, we've managed it in several areas. When you've got this notion of adverse selection, if you can experience rate, meaning you can put this, all the healthy people in one group and the sick people in another, you can charge them a lot and you can charge them a lot less, that's been beneficial for insurance companies. It doesn't help us provide universal coverage to people, but it does make it manageable in terms of premiums. This is why the notion of pre-existing illness has been so controversial because you want to limit that to limit adverse selection. This notion that you're gonna, that costs will go up when you get unhealthy people into your pool. So that's why, particularly in the individual insurance market, not in the employer market, but in the individual insurance market, why they limited pre-existing illness coverage. Because you could say to the person, okay, I'll insure you, but because you've already got diabetes, I'm not gonna cover your diabetes. You limit coverage on that part of it. And then you can keep premiums a bit lower <coughs> again. And then the notion of open enrollment's another way to deal with this, because you let everybody open it up so that everybody can come in and hopefully get this sort of balance. This is an interesting table because it really shows when you tell insurance companies that they can't do this, this experience rating where you differentiate the healthier from the unhealthy folks, when you don't allow this, look what happens. This is the probability of having um, group coverage. It goes up dramatically for healthy people. Um, it goes down for unhealthy. And that makes some sense, or it goes down for the healthy, up for the unhealthy, and that makes some sense because if you don't allow the medical underwriting, that differentiation of the premiums, the healthy people move out of the market and the unhealthy stay in. Um, does that make sense? You can see the same thing of the, it's the sort of the flip side of this with probability of being uninsured, um, being insured, it goes up for the, un, uh, the healthy and oops, that's a, because that should say uninsured. It goes up for the, un, the healthy and goes down for the unhealthy. So again, this has an impact. How we handle this has a significant impact on the premiums and who gets coverage. So then there's another um, very basic concept in health insurance called moral hazard. And this quote, I think, really uh, tells you what that means. A house may face a variety of fire hazards. It can be struck by lightning. It can, be, it can burn down. But... It can be destroyed because the owner set it on fire to collect the insurance money. So these are hazards in the, in the fire insurance market. We've translated that to the health insurance market. This ha last hazard is, hazard is referred to as the moral hazard. You do something bad in order to get the insurance coverage. In healthcare, we use that from the notion that it's assumed that when you are covered by health insurance that you'll use more of it. Um, you'll ski down the hill at a really fast pace because it doesn't matter if you land on a tree, you've got health insurance and it will take care of you. Um, <laughs> that's sort of the extreme of the notion of the moral hazard. You'll see the doctor more, etc. You'll go into the emergency room more. Um, 
So insurance companies manage this one by all this stuff, which as consumers we find difficult. So they, this out-of-pocket stuff, they put deductibles um, for us. They make co-pays and co-insurances. And that's so that we've got skin in the game and we say, oh, well, maybe I shouldn't um, go to the doctor or to the emergency room. I guess I could take care of this one on my own. We've got skin in the game. This is where annual and lifetime limits comes in. We limit the amount that you can spend per year that the insurance company will pay for, and then we limit it over the course of a lifetime. And then this, if you've had surgery or something like that, you know all about prior authorization. Your insurance, the, the person that's gonna do the insurance contact, or the surgery contacts your insurance company who then says, yeah, you can do it, or no, you can't, or whatever. These were all to address this issue of moral hazard. And you'll see this, this is a very simple drawing, but it really hits it. If I have to pay $100 for going in to see a healthcare provider, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna use that very much. You can see what happens to demand. If it goes down to 25, well, man, demand goes up a lot. I start to use that service much, much more. So those are two really basic concepts about insurance that I think are important, and they'll keep coming back as we talk about Obamacare. Now, very briefly, this is not all of Obamacare. Obamacare is huge. You guys all remember probably the pictures of the 2,000 pages, and uh, no one had read it, including, I think, Max Baucus admitted that he'd never read it either. Um, so it's huge, but these are the provisions that I'm going to talk about that are about what we're talking about today. So one's the market reforms, the exchanges, and then the Medicaid expansion, which of course became optional with the Supreme Court ruling back in whatever, I can't remember when that was, 2014, I think. So the market reforms, um, it's really the individual mandate, it's the employer pay or play mandate, and then it's the insurance market reforms, which are all these down here. So what, we, what Obamacare said was in terms of accessibility, we're gonna have this thing called guaranteed issue and renewability, and that's addressing the pre-existing illness issue. So it's saying that you have to, the, on the insurance market, if you're providing insurance, you have to take that person and you cannot exclude them based on uh, healthcare issues. Not only that, but you have to automatically guarantee renewal of that as well. You can't cut somebody off because halfway through the year they get diagnosed with some horrific illness. You have to keep them on. These are absolutely critical in terms of the pre-existing component here. Affordability, I talked about experience rating. There's something called community rating. And community rating, you let in an insurance world, you let everybody in, and that's how employer insurance often is essentially done. Um, everybody gets in the pool. Um, so what they've done in Obamacare is done, it's sort of a modified community rating. They can, in the insurance market, you can rate for, I have to think for a minute, age, geographic location, smoking status, but you cannot do anything related to illness. It, there is no, you can't focus on a person's health status um, in rating that. In terms of adequacy, over here, this is where the essential health benefits came in, saying if you're gonna offer an insurance um, policy on the exchange, it has to have these components. Um, and this has been controversial, because this is the piece that said that um, maternity care had to be covered. Um, and, in, and people saying, well, I'm a 65-year-old man, why should I have to pay for um, more, more that kind of care? So, but, that, but this came in, in the essential benefits. And then there was this whole piece about transparency. Before the market was out, it was difficult to figure out. If you were in the private individual market, you could sign up for a lot of different insurance and hope that something would come back, and then you could try to compare what you might get, but it was, it was difficult, frankly. So the market actually built in a lot of transparency so that you could get in, in theory, and, and look at a bunch of different plans. They have these bronze and silver and gold, different levels. You could see the cost. You could see what was covered in those. You would know what you would be paying out, what the, what the um, um, subsidy for you would be. So it was meant to provide a lot of transparency in as well. So that's a snapshot of the ACA. Now back to what we just talked about though, this is where the game of Jenga comes in. These insurance markets, which um, in Wyoming, ours is in the federal exchange. You had the option when these were developed, states could do it themselves or they could have the federal government do it. Wyoming opted to have the federal government um, do it. So we're in the federal exchange. Um, as I said before, there are these significant components. So guaranteed issue is a key piece of the insurance exchange. The insurance companies cannot rate on health status at all. 
again, it's age and geographic location and smoking status, but that's it. They can't do anything, they can't say again, you've had pre-existing illness, we're not going to cover you. And that's great because you guys probably all heard those horrific stories of people who could not get coverage or got coverage and then the insurance company, again, in the private, in the individual market, dropped them because they said, oh, you didn't give us complete information about your health history when you signed up and therefore we're not going to cover your horrific case of cancer here and they dropped them. And these were in the news, they were terribly compelling. So this became really important for all of us as consumers so that people could get insurance company coverage. Then there were the subsidies because if you think about it, back to this notion of um, adverse selection, we're now bringing into this pool a number of people who have past history, medical histories who are going to be more expensive. So thinking back to adverse selection, when you have guaranteed issue, what's going to happen to our premiums? they're going to go up because we're bringing a lot of people into the pool who are not healthy and have higher insurance costs. So then you have to have the subsidies because the premiums are going up, so you have to build the subsidy in so that people can actually afford to buy the insurance on the private exchange. So then the other key piece of this, um, this sort of interesting stool here, is the individual mandate. So because with guaranteed issue, you're bringing in people who are less healthy and have higher, uh, higher health care costs, you want to offset that by bringing in people who are healthy. That's where the individual mandate comes in. By requiring everybody to have coverage, you bring in the, uh, typically, not totally, but typically a younger population who generally is more healthy and has lower health care costs. So when you think about this, if you pull one of these out, you just create this and the tower falls over. Because if you pull out the subsidies, and there's a lot, Obama has just been talking about whether to hold the Democrats hostage with the sub, some, some of the subsidies. If you pull that out, the rest of the insurance market collapses because you can't sustain it. People cannot pay those premiums out of pocket. Go back to the slide that talks about 57,000 being the median income. People cannot afford these premiums on the market. Um, so it collapses. This is where the game of Jenga comes in. You also have probably heard the phrase death spiral in the news. This gets at what would happen if we start to pull some of these parts, uh, particularly the insurance market, out of place. So this, it's probably a little hard to read. Ideally up here what you want in an insurance pool is this nice balance of sick and healthy folks. Um, that sort of balances your cost. You've got a number of people who don't have high costs in terms of your insurance that offset the folks in the pool who have higher costs than the others. So if health insurance, if the healthy people drop their insurance, then the insurance companies have to pay out more. So if those healthier people are getting out of my pool, my costs then as an insurance company start to go up per individual. So then I've got to do something about that. I've got to raise the premiums or I've got to increase the deductibles, or I've got to increase some of the co-pays and the co-insurances. And you've probably, a number of you, depending on how you get your insurance, have already experienced some of these changes happening. So then if you do all three of those, a bunch more healthy people leave the market because they're thinking, man, this is getting a little, I'm, I don't have anything. I, you know, every couple years I end up going in because I, you know, have a bad cold or something like that. But, man, this is getting to the point that's too expensive for me to stay in. So they pull out and then you've got even a smaller pool with more people in it who are less healthy, who have higher costs. And that's what the death spiral is. You see this spiraling down. And that, when they're talking about that in terms of Obamacare, that's what they're talking about this happening on the individual exchanges. Now it's interesting over here because the CMS, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services, have indicated that in 2016, healthcare spending only grew by about 5%, less than 5%. Um, and pr yet premiums have increased by 25%. Why is that? Now back to this death spiral, if you think about it, particularly on the individual um, exchange, those are going up because this is happening in some of the insurance markets. The healthier folks are pulling out. It's easier to pay the tax um, liability than to pay for the premiums on the individual market. So that there, there are probably other reasons they're going up, but part of that could Im imply that it's partly because of the death spiral on some of the exchanges. Now, despite our angst about the ACA, it's actually had, it actually accomplished what it set out to accomplish. This is an interesting graph that really shows you uninsured over time. Look what happened here's 
This is when Obamacare started to, the, particularly the individual markets and the Medicaid expansion came into place. Look what happened, we're down to 10.3. We've not had that low of an uh, uninsured rate in a long, long time. Um, so despite our angst, I think as a country about the ACA, it did, it, set, it did what it set out to do. Now, interestingly enough, um, because of that, and partic particularly because of the political climate right now in our country, people have sort of realized that actually, despite our angst about Obamacare, we, it turns out we kind of liked it too. Um, and you really see the change in the public opinion. It's this blue part here is the people who've seen it positively. And these were sort of the low points here when the private insurance exchange rollout occurred, which was quite frankly, horrifically handled by the Democrats um, in the Obama administration. So you see people very unhappy with it here. Starts to go up and continues to go up. And now here's, since the Trump administration has come in and the, the um, increased uh, urge to repeal and replace. So actually we've kind of woken up and realized this was probably a good thing. We're not, in, we're not all on that page, but increasing number of people are saying, wait a minute, uh, we, we need to stop and slow down <coughs> on this. But that's not, there are not significant problems. So this, and this will stand out to oh, those of us in Wyoming right here, we are one of the places in the country that has one um, insurer on our federal exchange that's offering uh, insurance in Wyoming. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Wyoming is the sole one providing. So that begins to tell you, now there are others that are not like that, but that begins to tell you that this is, these are markets that are probably much less stable than other parts of the country. But then you look at these gray areas where there are actually a number. Those are probably much more healthy markets than the one in Wyoming. We are really down to one. And look at this slide. This was a study published recently that looked at premiums in urban and rural areas. If you look at the dotted lines, those are um, rural areas. And these are the red are the federal exchange, and then the blue are the, state, the places that have state exchanges. But on both federal and state exchanges, look at what's happening to the premiums in the rural areas, um, going up absolutely dramatically, very quickly. And again, that kind of makes sense when you think back to Wyoming. We've only got one insurer on there. Um, this notion of the you can't get a big pool. If you talk to the folks at Blue Cross Blue Shield, they can relate to you case after case of very expensive individuals coming onto the individual market. And they feel committed to take care of them, but these folks are costing a huge amount um, of money because they have a potentially a very rare disease and then a treatment for it that is just unbelievably expensive. So our, this makes sense that in the rural areas our premiums are going up more rapidly than in the urban areas. So because of that, as you know, out has come uh, the idea that we need to, um, after seven years of Obamacare, um, with a change in leadership in, the, in Washington, um, we've decided we need to go back and repeal and replace now. I love this particular slide because here's we got Uncle Sam saying that took seven years and <laughs> Paul Ryan talking about, well, we put a lot of time into the slide um, and into the sign. So they, they have announced their plan. As you all know, if you followed the news, there was a big to do about it over the course of about, I think maybe 17 days at the most. And then the bill was withdrawn and um, uh, President Trump said, that's it for health care. We're not going to go back to it. We're going to turn towards uh, tax reform. Um, and so we all thought it was off the table for a while. It's coming back. I'll sort of walk you through some of the main things. This, this was called the Animal, uh, animal American Health Care Act. <laughs> that was probably a Freudian strip slip of some sort. I won't speak to that. I'll have to, do what, I'll have to do what Professor Roberts did and step out of my official UW role and confess to some things. Um, the American Health Care Act, what the original proposal, there have been some changes since then in the, in the latest rounds of negotiation, but the, this is the major components of what came out of that. They do want to repeal the individual mandates and the premium and cost sharing subsidies. Now think back to our three-legged stool there and what will happen if that happens. They'll modify the ACA premium tax credits. They want to retain the private market rules uh, guarantee issue. Um, again, keep that three-legged stool in your head. They want to retain the health insurance marketplace. What they want to do in place of the individual marketplace is, or, or the individual mandate is to flip that around. So you don't have a penalty for not having coverage. You have a penalty in essence for not keeping coverage. So if you drop coverage, once you step back on and try to pay coverage, you will pay a penalty of like 
I think it's 30% over the next 12 months. So the idea is to try and keep people on coverage. Um, now whether that would work or not is uh, yet to be seen. Uh, they're going to encourage health savings accounts. They want to limit the Medicaid expansion. What The Medicaid expansion that in place will stay in place, but I think by 2020 they will let no further expansion into place and they'll just uh, re retain coverage for those that are on it but cut back on the expansion piece of it. And then a big piece of what they want to do is convert Medicaid um, to a capita or a block grant and we'll talk briefly about that. So let's look at a couple of these components and see what they might mean. Oh, before I get to that, this is sort of what happened with that. The CBO report came out and it showed this, that the number of uninsured by 2026 would be increased by 24 million. This would not necessarily, it got confusing in the news. This doesn't mean that 24 people, million people would have their coverage ripped away from them. It could be people who, because the individual mandate is gone, choose not to have coverage. So it could be, it's a combination of people probably losing coverage and people taking and deciding not to take coverage as well. But this was, this here hit the news particularly hard, that this number of people, we would returning back to what we were in terms of uninsured rates to the pre-Obamacare pre -Obama days. So this sort of sealed, I think, uh, the fate of the original round of this the Republican plan. But let's talk about a couple pieces. Uh, one very strong conservative argument in health care reform has, uh, has been the health savings accounts, the HSAs. And the idea behind the HSAs is that, you know, out-of-pocket care, you have to pay a premium and then your deductibles and then your co-payments and your co-insurances. What the health savings account does is step in here and allow the person to have this ongoing rollover account that they can use to cover these out-of-pocket expenses, not the premium. You can't pay the premium out of the health savings account, but you can pay any part of your deductible or any co-payments or co-insurances out of the health savings account. Now that sounds good and there are some real advantages to HSAs. Um, for example, they are tax deductible. They are actually tax free. So when you withdraw, when the individual withdraws out of that health savings account, it's tax free. It's tax deferred because you can, can you continue to accumulate within that health savings account. And the interesting part of this is that it, the HSAs is it's owned by the individual. It's not the employers. So if the individual changes employers, they can keep that HSA with them. They can take it along the way if they go to other employers. However, the insurance has been a little less than as positive as, as would be liked. So there are lower premiums because you're buying a high deductible plan with the HSA. So that lowers the premium charge. But that, what that does is really shift financial risk from the insurance company to the individual that owns the HSA. You're shifting the risk to them. The premiums and the out-of-pocket costs consume a significant portion of low-income persons. These are not a great solution for coverage of people who are low-income. Low-income families don't really um, have enough tax liability often to really benefit from the tax provisions in this. Again, a, a middle class or higher class person would benefit from the, the tax issue, but they don't necessarily. People with chronic illness are still going to have significant out-of-pocket costs that may be um, prohibitive for them. And I think one of the most concerning pieces of this is that studies have shown that with an HSA, the cost sharing that you have with it does actually decrease um, primary care use and preventive care use, which is actually what we would want people to do. Um, but people will say, you know, I, I'm going to hold off on whatever that happens to be my mammogram. I'm going to hold off on my whatever. Uh, I don't want to spend that money right now. And that can have negative ramifications. So HSAs have some potential, but actually have some also significant um, issues with them as well. So another um, very prominent conservative plan has been changes to Medicaid. And I put this slide up here because when Medicaid was initially um, a, a pr a approved, voted on, it was not meant to be what it was today, to be quite honest with you. It has grown. It is absolutely huge. So this quote from the New York Times the other day, one in five Americans is now covered on Medicaid. That was never the original intent. It was meant to, to cover this group. You had employer insurance covering most people. They passed Medicare to get people who were past the point of working, they were senior citizens or were disabled. And then there was this group over here who was low income. So Medicaid was supposed to step in and cover that group. And it was supposed to be relatively small. Over time, Medicaid has become huge. It's health insurance coverage over here. 
it, this is a very big piece of it and one that's extremely challenging. These are called dual enrollees. These are people who are on Medicaid and Medicare both. They tend to be a very, they're obviously low income because they're on Medicaid. They also tend to be in very poor health. They're a very costly group. So these are the dual eligibles that have both. Medicaid becomes a, essentially a Medigap policy for some people on Medicare. This is one of the hugest parts of Medicaid, I think that's unappreciated in the country. Medicaid is the biggest funder of long-term care. So Medicaid covers our parents and grandparents um, when they're in the nursing home. They have to spend down their assets and do a number of things to be eligible for Medicaid. But if you have somebody who has Alzheimer's in your family and needs long-term care in a nursing home for four to five years, there's nobody else that picks that up if you can't cover it um, yourself except for Medicaid. Um, so it is a huge funder of long-term care. So this was not what Medicaid was intended to be, but it is what Medicaid has, has become. And the reason I put it up here is there are pros and cons to doing changes with Medicaid, but one of the critical issues that we need to keep in mind is if we do change Medicaid, think about the incredible impact across all of this, and we need to be very, very clear when we talk about changes in Medicaid, what those, those ramifications are going to be. And we'll talk about a couple that are proposed by in the Republican plan. So one of the big things is block grants or per capita caps where you control the amount that's going to the state. And that actually sounds pretty good, but I think again, back to my original point, these are fundamental, fundamental changes to Medicaid funding. And they may be good, but they will have significant ramifications if we do that. And again, I put this slide up here just to show you. Here's 1966 when Medicaid came into, into existence. 2% of the population, and it stayed that way for a long time. But look at this skyrocketing rate since the mid-80s, mid um, absolutely going up to where, again, one in five persons are covered by Medicaid. This is a little hard to read, so I'll skip to the next slide because I think it's a little bit easier to see. So one of the proposals um, in the Republican pan plan is to think about a block grant for Medicaid. So right now, in essence, Medicaid is shared the costs by the federal government and the state government. It varies by state, but it's roughly 50-50% um, coverage. So 50% comes from the federal government, 50% comes from the state. Um, and it's basically b um, given on charge. I mean, you, this is, a, this is a entitlement. So you can't, the state can't say on December 13th, um, to somebody that needs Medicaid, sorry, we ran out of our money this year and you'll have to wait till January to get on it. We have to take that person. It's an entitlement program. What changes with this idea of a block grant is that instead of just, again, that 50% coming to the state, no matter what's happening there, that, and the federal government, that keeps coming. Now the federal government says, I'm gonna give you, we're gonna give you X amount of money based on historical data, based on this sort of baseline spending down here. So if we kept with the old form of Medicaid, in theory, it would go like this, and that then takes into account changes in the state, economic downturns, changes in healthcare costs. With a block grant, there's gonna be reductions over time because we're no longer looking at these. The place is getting, the state is getting this amount from the federal government based on this spending. Now what that caught, what you have to think about with that form of uh, funding is, think about what happens to Medicaid enrollments whenever there's an economic downturn in the state. Every time, so in the last couple years, as the state's economy has been difficult in Wyoming, Medicaid enrollments go up. That makes sense. It's not a surprise. With a block grant, it's going to be difficult to account for those. Those, the state's going to have to figure out how to handle those changes in enrollments in a block grant that wouldn't be covered now by the federal government. The federal government's not going to increase their portion that's coming with the block grant. The state has to figure that out on their own. Now the other proposal then is for a per capita. This is meant to take into account that piece of it. This, in this particular case, again, you've got this baseline spending, but here it will take in the number of enrollees. So this doesn't account for changes in healthcare costs, but it would account for, again, a really tough year in that state, either because of a, well, a Katrina type event in Louisiana, a huge natural disaster, or a downturn in the economy. But still, the idea behind these is to, over time, limit the amount that the federal government is giving. We're, we're dropping that piece of it over time. Now, that could be an okay thing. You can t you'll talk to some um, healthcare people who will say, well, that's actually okay. 
if we do the block grant, the idea is that the exchange is that the states would be freed up from some of the bureaucracy from the federal government about how they have to run their Medicaid program. So some folks will say, well, we could probably live with that. Um, that's probably yet to be tested since it's somewhat of a natural experience. Am I getting close? Five minutes. Ooh, I better let's see what I have left to do here. Selling insurance across state lines. This is another big Republican um, idea. This sounds really good, um, except for the reality is it doesn't help all that much. Um, when, you've, when you look at the evidence on this, um, insurance is regulated at the state by and large, not totally, but by and large. Um, but what happens is that the primary barrier to moving across from one state to the next state in, a, in the insurance market is actually the ability to set up networks and negotiate reduced prices. That's what insurance companies do. And that's a bigger barrier than actually the state regulations that prohibit that. High risk pools are really being talked a lot, a lot right now. If you pull away that individual mandate and you've got people in the pool who are expensive, one idea is the state could carve them all off and put them into one pool together. That sounds good, but again, think back to my three-legged stool. These are very going to be very expensive pools of beneficiaries. You cannot make these work without huge significant subsidies in them. No one can afford the premiums in this kind of a market. These have been in states um, already. They have tended not to be successful, again, because they are very, very costly to run. So what's next? I have no idea. This is President Trump's tweet a couple weeks ago, Obamacare will explode and we'll all get together and piece together a great health care plan for the people. Do not worry. I don't think that's how the, 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 uh, most of us in the, in the country are thinking about this. I think most of us are very worried. There's a whole bunch that they could do to dismember it without actually repealing it. And that's a list of some of the stuff. Secretary Price has huge leeway. His name is, uh, not his name personally, but the Secretary of State over and over is listed in things that he or she could do to Obamacare within um, the policy without having to change it. But this runs a huge political risk. Um, the Republicans are sort of trying to tell people that the Democrats still own health care reform. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the rest of us in the country are not believing that and saying, no, when, the, when you have the White House, the um, House and the Senate, no, health care reform is yours. So there's a huge political risk to doing this. And I love this, um, the town halls. <laughs> now, what makes this even funnier is this is not a recent um, cartoon. This is actually a cartoon from 2009 when it was flipped and the Democrats were going home to have Republicans absolutely infuriated over Obamacare. They could alternately shore up ACA. We'll see if that happens. There's an interesting topic. We can talk about this one. This is an interesting time that there could be interesting discussion about universal coverage. Um, when you think about the populist world we're in right now, both on the left and the right, um, covering everybody could actually come out of that in a way that we hadn't thought about before. And I'll leave it at this quote from JFK. So let's begin anew, remembering on both sides that civility is not a sign of weakness and sincerity is always subject to proof. Let us never negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate. Let both sides explore what problems unite us instead of belaboring those problems which divide us. In your hands, my fellow citizens, more than mine, will rest the, future, the final success or failure of our course. And I think that's probably something we need to think about right now. Yeah. I, do I have time for questions? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'll go here first. Could you recap what you the like main point of your presentation is because we were rushing and we really you gave us lots of information and we don't know the which way are you going. Really the main point of this discussion is that um, repeal and replace is incredibly complex and the ramifications of it are huge. Um, and the reality is, if you stop and think about it, if we get out of sort of the heated divide we have, um, partisan divide we have about health care reform, Obamacare is, was probably flawed from the beginning. Even though it's had success and we've decreased the number of people who are uninsured, it does not nearly take us where we need to be. Um, it's, a, it's a bill, it's an act that needs um, not repealing and replacing, but significant repairing as well to be honest with you. Let's go you first. You had yours up quickly. Yeah. Um, so before um, ACA, in, before 08, premiums were rising. Yes. People forget that. Yes. We had two problems. Pe 
a, a vast number of people were not insured, plus premiums were rising. Okay, now less people are uninsured, Those rates but dropped. premiums are still rising. What is the difference? Why were premiums rising then versus why they're rising now? Some, there, there are a couple of explanations. Now, premiums are rising at very extremely variable rates. If you look them by state, and I'm thinking mostly about the, the individual insurance market, they vary significantly. So, for example, last year in Phoenix, Arizona, they went up by like 100% or something. But then you had other states that actually were decreasing their, their premiums. They dropped um, from what they were the previous years. So, first of all, there's a significant variability in, in rising of costs. They are in general going up, but there's a lot of variability which tells you something about those individual markets as well, healthy markets versus markets that are probably not as healthy. So there's that piece of it. The other humongous piece of the pie, which Obamacare, quite frankly, did not address, is the huge overall rising costs of health care anyway, outside of the premiums. Um, that slide I showed you where we spend uh, roughly about 10000 per capita relative to all these other countries that spend, in many cases, half of that, we have the most, health, most costly health care um, a system, if you can call it a system, in the world. And so we've never addressed, there isn't much in Obamacare that really, as they say, bends the cost curve. There are some small things like the accountable care organizations, but though that's pretty small in the overall picture. So nothing in Obamacare, this, this, this has been the trend in the increase in healthcare costs in our country, not much really t starts to get us like this. Um, so that it's probably both of those components, if that makes sense. Let's go here first. Um, I was just wondering if there's a clause or anything included in the acts or proposals that is a deterrent for individuals to seek, um, I'm trying to figure out how to word this, instead of going to a primary care physician, they run to the ER because their doctor can't get them in that same day. Is there any type of deterrent for that? Not that I can think think of? I'm looking over at my colleague Christy over here, not that I can think of. I mean, there's been concern, but I'll, I will also tell you that we have this sense that people who are uninsured use the emergency room for care. I work in an ER. And they do. And they, they, they don't. They do, they do, but actually they really don't. If you look at, look at ER use by people, by um, those who are uninsured, those who are insured, and those who are on like Medicaid and Medicare, the rates of uninsured using the emergency room are actually remarkably less. And it, it makes sense when you think about it. They can't, you now have a $15,000 bill at the hospital. So the sad part of being uninsured is that the tendency is not to use any health care at all. Um, so yes, there is some use of the emergency room by uninsured. I was actually more implying individuals. I tend to see more people on Medicare and Medicaid making the statement of my doctor couldn't get me in today, so I came here instead. Which is sad. For, Very sad. For minimal things. And that say. speaks to the change that needs to happen in practice. You know, lots of pa practices now are experimenting with much different ways of scheduling so that you've always got open scheduling time so that somebody calls in that morning, they can get a slot. So that actually speaks very much to changes that need to happen in how we do primary care and outpatient care as well. I'm seeing one Paul. Question. One question. Um, I was just wondering why the uh, expenses that we, uh, the amount of expenses that we have in America, why are so different, like so vastly different from what we spend in other countries? You know, and that, there, there are multiple, multiple pieces of that. Um, so let's take simply uh, drugs, for example. In the United States, we pay much more for drugs than any other country. Part of the uh, um, argument by Big Pharma is that that's because we tend to do a lot of research here. There's a little bit of truth to that, not completely. But let's take Part D, which is the drug benefit on Medicare. Um, the, when that bill was passed, that was in the Bush administration, the federal government was prohibited from negotiating prices on the drug market. So many other countries, again, what happens when you've got universal coverage is either you've got the one, you've got the one payer or these multiple public and private payers, and they negotiate with the providers. In that particular case, in terms of drug costs, the federal government cannot. So the federal government cannot negotiate drug costs under Medicare Part D. And that's only one example that's extended into other and other areas, but it gives you a sense of why we have some issues in terms of costs um, as well. Thank you very much.